couple of seconds while people log into. Hello, welcome everybody. We're just going to get started in a few moments here, just as uh, people trickle in. Hope everyone is having a good Friday, wherever you are. Maybe I'll just give it one more moment just as those numbers kind of creep up here. Um, welcome everybody. Okay, I think things are starting to level off, so I'm gonna get started. Um, so welcome to Succession Planning for Cultural Institutions, part one. Uh, my name is Greg Stewart. I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, or CCHA. I use he and they pronouns. Um, for accessibility's sake, I will say I am a white person with glasses, wearing a collared brown shirt and an undershirt with a yellow background and a bookcase behind me. Um, just a little bit more about um, uh, this afternoon's program. So uh, cultural sector professionals are notorious, as you all know, for wearing the proverbial many hats and making extraordinary use of scarce resources. Um, staff transitions, whether unexpected or, plans, or, or planned, can often be disruptive and stressful in these environments. With shifts to the workforce and volunteer pipelines, succession planning and knowledge transfer are becoming more important to address. Uh, in 2023, members of the 15 arts and cultural organizations, uh, of, of 15 arts and cultural organizations participated in listening sessions, supporting the collection stewardship succession planning initiative, a joint effort by us, the Conservation Center and um, Lyricist that you'll learn more about in a minute, um, funded by a museum leadership grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. This input, along with insights from museum, library, and arts professionals across the country, has led to the development of tools and resources to support, uh, better support succession planning for collections care and management roles at cultural institutions. Uh, today, Michelle Eisenberg, our executive director, and Tom Clarison, senior consultant for digital and preservation services at uh, Lyricis, are going to be presenting their findings on this project. Um, so just before we get to that, some Zoom housekeeping. You are in Zoom web webinar, which means your video and audio are turned off, but you can ask questions or make comments to us in the chat at any time. Uh, the program is auto closed captioned in English, and you can turn on subtitles with the little CC button in the Zoom toolbar. So the format for today, we're gonna have a presentation from our speakers, uh, followed by Q&A with you, but like I say, please feel free to ask those questions at any time as they come up, and I will, when we get to Q&A, be reading them verbally to our speakers. Um, you will all have already seen this little dialogue pop up, but just to reiterate, the program is being recorded, and we'll send a recording as well as the PowerPoint and any other resources we've shared in a follow-up email. Um, so uh, big thanks to IMLS for supporting this program. Um, and Michelle, if you could just um, go to the next slide, please. On. So just one quick note. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> just a quick note about the organization that we work for, CCHA. We are a regional conservation lab and preservation services facility. We're based in Philadelphia, um, but we work with organizations and clients all across the country. Our conservators treat paper-based objects like books, photographs, documents, artwork on paper, and more. Our preservation services staff work in the field, providing education programs and helping institutions plan for the future of uh, their collections. The center also offers a wide range of digitization services, as well as fundraising assistance, housing, framing, and more. And you can learn more about what we do at our website, ccha.org. So a bit more about our speakers. Um, Michelle Eisenberg, as I mentioned, is our executive director. She is responsible for executing CCHA's strategic goals and business planning initiatives. She manages large-scale conservation and preservation projects with partner organizations, leading internal and external teams. She oversees our budget and works with the board of directors on business development. Prior to joining CCHA, Michelle worked at Schultz & Williams, a consulting firm serving the nonprofit sector. 
Uh, Michelle was formerly Associate Director of Temple University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute and held several development roles at the National Constitution Center. She has an MBA from Temple University and a BA uh, in History from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and Tom Clarison is the project director for uh, the Performing Arts Readiness Project, or PAR, funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation to help performing arts and organizations nationwide learn how to protect their assets, sustain operations, and be prepared for emergencies. He serves as senior consultant for digital and preservation services at Lyricist, uh, consulting and teaching nationally and internationally on preservation, disaster preparedness, digitization, digital preservation, special collections, archives, remote storage, funding, strategic planning, and advocacy for libraries, archives, and museums. That's a lot. <laughs> We're so glad to have you here, Tom. Um, and he also serves as vice president on the board of directors of the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom to tell us a bit more about Lyricist now. Okay, thank you. And Michelle, next slide. Um, so thank you, uh, Greg and Michelle. I am representing, as uh, Greg mentioned, both uh, Lyricist, the Library, Archive, and Museum Service Network, um, where I consult on preservation and digitization issues, and Performing Arts Readiness, where I am the project director. And I wanted to uh, give you information about, uh, you can reach our website uh, from uh, the information here. And on, on our next slide, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information on PAR. Um, we pro provide a variety of information resources at our website on disaster planning for arts organizations, and we're also now looking at even providing information on um, archiving and starting to do preservation planning if you have an archive in an arts organization. We have a series of about 20 free live and recorded webinars by international experts and a variety of grants for arts organizations in uh, dealing with uh, disaster planning, recovery, and archiving issues. And the main reason that I am here is that through my work with both PAR and Lyricist, I have seen the need for succession planning in a variety of cases. So I'm really glad to have been working uh, from the beginning of 2023 on uh, with CCAHA on um, the uh, uh, this project. So thank you. And oh, I would need to give uh, my uh, description. Sorry about that. Um, I'm a white male with glasses, brown hair, a gray shirt, and I have a white background with a couple of screens and pictures. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I can kick off the, the project description here and um, description of myself. I'm a, a white female with shoulder length dark hair, um, wearing a, a white jacket over a blue and white shirt, and my background is blurred today. Um, well, we are, are so excited to, to uh, share our findings from a project that's that's been a long time in the making. Um, you know, as 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 Tom and Greg mentioned, our our institutions serve the cultural heritage sector, um, and we are taking this opportunity to create resources focused on succession planning. This this very important topic, and the the findings today will will highlight why it's such a, a critical time to be looking at this issue. Um, we are also realizing that there's a need not just for, for resources, but for programs um, like this and, and our future webinars that'll really help uh, professionals practice these, these good strategies, um, both for, for staff transitions, also volunteer transitions. We realize a lot of cultural heritage organizations um, have, have leadership, not just volunteer leadership, but sometimes volunteers who are actually running the organization on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have so far completed, uh, as Greg mentioned, a, a wonderful series of listening sessions, and then also a survey um, that went out to uh, quite a few organizations and, and had really good participation, which you'll hear about. 
we were looking for information on strategies that that have worked for organizations regarding succession planning and knowledge transfer, and also maybe what what's been problematic. Uh, we've had a wonderful national advisory panel representing museums, libraries, archives, large, small, state affiliated, private, um, really great panel of advisors. And then we've also enlisted um, similar professionals from, from across the sector to review the resources um, before we are putting them out uh, in general. What, what we actually have available is, is still kind of under review and, and in draft form, um, but we will, we're continuing to, to refine things as we go. Uh, and then, as Tom mentioned, we've been working since early 2023 on this. The um, the survey actually uh, was informed by the listening sessions, and that was fielded almost a year ago. Uh, and then we've really taken the the fall of last year and and winter to to dive into what types of resources are you know suggested by the the findings. Uh, from the research, uh, developing and testing those resources. And then since since February, we've been presenting at conferences uh, around the country, uh, disseminating the results of the research, testing out the resources further. And then we are um, compiling everything on our website, which we'll have the, the QR code for a little bit later. And um, we're continuing to to roll out additional education programs. Tom, I think this is your section here, right? Yes, uh, thank you. You know, our results so far from the project have really far exceeded our expectations. Um, I've been working on a lot of research projects in the past, and um, I have not seen interest like this in a long time. Uh, we had 16 list listening sessions that were held uh, when we originally in our grant plan six, and we plan to have 50 attendees and had almost 270. Um, so uh, just that was helping to show what a, a level of interest there is in this project. Um, we held virtual and in-person listening sessions for a number of arts and culture associations and organizations. So we were at a, out at a lot of conferences during 2023. And in fact, we had to extend our research period because people kept on saying, we want to talk about this too. And the most interesting thing was, and Michelle and I oftentimes were in disbelief over this, Every time we went to a new conference and held a new listening session, we were hearing new insights. And um, so that was really uh, interesting to see. Um, our survey attracted 156 participants. And what we saw from that information was that it supported, but even went beyond the findings of the listening sessions. And there was great quantitative information, but there were also uh, some really interesting comments that I'll be talking about a little bit later. We're going to focus on a lot of the survey findings in just a few minutes. And the thing that we really have uh, appreciated is that a lot of those organizations who invited us to do listening sessions in 2023 invited us back to talk about the findings and to test some of the resources at their 2024 conferences. Everything from the Small Museum Association in February of this year to Chorus America just a couple of weeks ago. And it was funny because they said, we'll do these listening sessions, but you need to come back with some products. You need to come back with some things to work through. Um, so we were able to work with all these organizations and start to test some of the resources we're creating as well. So on the next slide, you'll see that we had a lot of key findings. And I'll talk um, uh, just for a couple of minutes. Um, and this is definitely, from my point of view, the most important thing that I'm going to talk about uh, during the session today. Um, I think the what we saw was, and we sort of expected this, but the majority of participants and organizations had very little experience with formal succession planning, and we heard from all of them that lack of time was seen as the biggest barrier. Um, succession planning was seen as a low priority at many organizations, both when we talked in our listening sessions and when we were doing our work on our survey. 
but we found out that it was a high priority personally for the employees, for the representatives of the organizations that came to our listening session. They said, we really need to know about this for our future advancement, for our future job planning. They also were saying that the board is not as concerned about this level of planning. So you'll see and hear about both today and in our July session where we look at our resources that we have created a number of resources for bringing the board in as far as awareness is concerned. There's definitely a need to recognize differences between standard succession planning and really none as standard. Sometimes it always seems like a little bit of a, uh, a speed bump for the organization, but we also talked a lot with people about emergency succession planning after the sudden unplanned departure of a uh, organizational leader. So we've uh, tried to start thinking about with our resources and our classes and everything, um, how to differentiate between those two uh, areas of succession planning. One of the most interesting things that happened, and it started at the very first of the listening sessions that we did was, People said, yes, we need documentation on succession planning, but many of the respondents that we had from the cultural heritage and the arts world said that basic collection and operating policies were also necessary. And one of the things I really love is that um, we have with the CCAHA staff um, some collection policies that have been developed and used in projects and used for organizations for years. And um, the uh, CCAHA has actually um, made those available and sort of given a condensed version there for here are the kind of policies you might want to have and here are the, the kind of resources and models that are out there. Michelle has been talking a little bit about a knowledge transfer process for employee work experience, and I think that's key. Um, it really allows for experienced and senior staff to pass along what they've learned, and we think that, um, that there needs to be time made for that, but there are also opportunities presented by new technology to do this. And um, we'll talk about some of the uh, resources we have, including one on doing oral histories, which are great for finding out about the organization, but they can also be used for this type of knowledge transfer as the organization is moving along. Just a few more key findings on our next slide. Um, we saw that issues of reductions in workforces and volunteer groups due to both early retirement and COVID have caused succession problems at organizations of all sizes, um, not just the small organizations, but across all types. Part-time and volunteer retention is a concern and just a strong communications program where we have um, uh, some uh, really good uh, two-way street discussion uh, between uh, staff and uh, volunteers, between staff and uh, part-time uh, employees is um, important. One of the things that we heard about was uh, a situation where a uh, festival uh, saw that it was going to have about a 30 to 40 percent drop in uh, its volunteer staff for working at this music festival, and uh, they ended up being able to team up with another festival and do a little bit of shared staffing uh, and shared volunteer uh, usage uh, between the two uh, organizations. So that was really helpful, but it did become a concern and it was, re uh, I think, reported on at every one of our sessions. We see that many cultural and arts organizations are focusing on DEIA issues. And one of the things that everyone said, and you'll see this throughout all of the things we talk about with our research today, is that an important aspect of those discussions is compensation and pay equity. And um, so that was uh, really helpful for um, the listening sessions to bring up. We heard people say that emotional support 
for staff at organizations where succession planning has taken place needs to be provided. This can be a traumatic experience if there is a leader who's departing after a number of years at an organization, if there's a founding leader who is um, uh, working in arts organizations, if it is an artistic director who has actually been performing with a group, um, that can be uh, definitely something where there may be some need for emotional support and to uh, talk things out, talk things over afterwards. One of the groups that we had an excellent experience with in our listening session, and we are uh, going back to talk about our resources this year, is the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And there I heard loud and clear that maintaining relations with partner organizations and the community is extremely important when you're going through a succession process. And I guess one of the things that uh, everyone that we spoke to and uh, CCAHA and Lyricists are very interested in is that we'd like to shift succession planning from a finite task, something that can be on a checklist, to a way of operating. We think that many types of benefits can be seen from building this type of culture at your organization. So with those findings in mind, we want to talk a little bit about where we went in our next steps with the survey. And I will uh, pass the mic back over to Michelle. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, Camilla, I think uh, this is where we have our first poll question. Um, and we, we just have a couple of these. And um, part of what the goal is, is to see if if what the participants in this webinar experienced uh, is consistent with what we found in our survey. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, there were 156 responses in the survey. So this first question is, does your organization have any type of succession planning process or policy in place? Just give folks a few more seconds. So going to hope that I can advance my slides. I seem to have, oh, there we go. All right. So we have uh, about 74% saying that uh, they do not, another 24% are not sure, only 3% know for sure, which I think if you're coming to this webinar, you're you're probably somebody who recognizes you're you're in need of a plan. Um, this is uh, even even uh, more concerning than our uh, national poll, uh, in which uh, seventy five percent either either didn't know or or didn't have one in place. Um, the the little bright spot was that thirteen percent were were working on it um and and 11% had one so that's definitely where our goal is is to have more organizations get to that place but as you can see it it is a a critical need if if this large majority of organizations do not have that plan um and then of those uh this top graph here is is that only 25% have uh, if if they have a plan, only 25% have differentiated a, a situation where somebody suddenly leaves or suddenly can't fill their role, uh, an emergency, versus a uh, planned, you know, hopefully with with a, a longer time frame uh, succession process. And then looking at um, collecting institutions, which is a, a large part of of the uh, population that responded to the survey. Um, really, only only eleven percent of those organizations have succession plans that deal specifically with collections responsibilities. It it might be that there is a plan in place for the executive director or some other uh, general roles in the organization, but not for these collecting uh, collection stewardship roles. 
Here we talk about um, are there systems to support knowledge transfer um, when, when there are staff transitions so that there can be continuity of projects, continuity of practices, and about, about four in 10 responded that they have no systems and another four in 10 doubt that their systems are adequate. Um, so again, this, this really spoke to us of the need to, to help organizations um, develop this process, have some resources that would facilitate knowledge transfer. And have organizations have have respondents worked in an environment that experienced problems arising from a lack of succession planning? And unfortunately, um, about two thirds certainly had. Uh, and I think we have a poll next, correct? All right. And so specifically, what if you've experienced problems? What have they been? Um, take a few moments if, if you have a response to this question. And this would be, you know, you've had trouble accessing systems, buildings, rooms, disruption to projects, financial disruption, or oversight disruption where staff just don't don't have the guidance they need. All right, and this is check check all that apply. So let's let's see those results. Yep, ninety five percent of you um, definitely had had those oversight disruptions. Seventy two percent had project disruptions, and. Third place was inability to access systems, files, or equipment. I'm glad that inability to access buildings or rooms is is not is not too high, but I'm I'm sure you would agree that that's a, a serious problem. And obviously, financial disruptions are a very serious problem. All right, and so let's see how that tracks with our findings. As, as expected. Um, inability to, to access files and equipment, lack of guidance for remaining staff, and uh, disruption of momentum on projects. And then another one, um, as Tom mentioned from the listening session findings, we, we heard about how critical it was to maintain those external relationships, not just partners, vendors, volunteers, but also funders and, and other stakeholders. Um, that that is a, a big area of risk. And so so one of the things that in in our next webinar we'll be talking about the resources we've developed. Um, one of the the takeaways from um, from this research was that we we really wanted to highlight these risks of not doing succession planning. Um, I think there is another poll coming next. Yes. All right, so again, what might happen if you suddenly left your organization? We like to talk about this as, as if you, you won the lottery and decided to, to go off to Bora Bora. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, God forbid somebody gets injured or ill and um, has, to, has to temporarily leave suddenly. Um, you know, we, we are aware that these things happen. Um, and so again, we're we're asking about the kinds of, of disruptions, um, the how long it would take for the organization to to recover. Is there anybody who can who can take your place? Are there plans or documents that um, would ensure a smooth transition? We'll just take a few more minutes. All right, and we can see those results if we have enough responses. And this, sorry, I somehow on this one, we, we only asked for a single response. Um, 
So the results might look a little different than our general poll. And we have quite a few folks saying that if, if they were to leave, work might come to a temporary or longer standstill. Um, folks, about, about a quarter of folks are concerned that there wouldn't be staff currently at the organization who could take their place. And about 14% said it, it might take months to return to stability. Uh, and only about 3% of you felt that there were plans in place to ensure a smooth transition, which is consistent with the 3% at the beginning who said that uh, they had a succession plan. And so what does this look like uh, from our original poll? Very similar again. Um, and the big concern is, is that projects would, would come to a standstill and uh, that there, there really aren't staff to, to carry on. Therefore, it, it's going to take a long time for the organization to recover. And so really what we're trying to, to do with, with our project and the resources we're offering is, is to minimize these negative impacts. There, there are so many organizations that are, you know, it, it's hard enough. Everybody's wearing multiple hats and, and we're all operating on tight budgets and, um, any one of these things can can have a, a significant impact. Tom, did you have a comment or? Okay. All right, and actually, I'm sorry, Was uh, there was another poll, correct? Again, talking about whether succession planning is a, a high, low, or medium priority at your organization. All right, and this should be a fairly quick answer. So if we have some responses, let's see those results. And for more than half of you, it is unfortunately a low priority. Nice to see that that for about 11%, it, it it is a high priority. And so for for all of you, we're we're glad you're here with us today. Um, and again, as, as Tom highlighted from both the listening session feedback and this survey, um, really only about 20% is it a high priority and, uh, and, and about 40% say it said it was a low priority. And just a few more findings from the survey. Um, looking we we conceived of this project kind of coming off of the the pandemic and understanding a lot of the um, unfortunately the the layoffs that happened due to budgetary reasons and then there was a wave of retirements um, so really wanted to to ask folks about the issues that exacerbated uh, staff changes and and succession planning challenges in the last three years and um, obviously there. There was a lot due to COVID, due to funding and, and the pandemic, um, I'm sorry, due to just, well, pandemic related economic issues. Um, just in general, the, the pressure on salaries has, has driven a lot of staff transition. Um, and then the issue of lack of opportunities for advancement, which is, the subject of our next slide, that only about half of organizations, I'm sorry, only about 16% of, of, of respondents felt that their organization had presented them with a clear career advancement path, and fully half said that, that it hadn't. Um, and so obviously that is something that is going to, to drive some momentum in staff looking around for other opportunities and therefore the need for better succession planning. Um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about uh, what the listening session respondents cited as, as barriers to uh, making a, a better commitment to succession planning. 
lack of time, biggest barrier, um, lack of policies and examples, lack of staff knowledge. We're trying to address all of this with this project, um, including the, the lack of time. Um, you'll see in our, in our next webinar that a lot of the resources really are designed to be something that can be used um, quickly and, and uh, with fully understanding that, that folks don't have a lot of time, but some progress in any way is, is essential. All right. I think it's right. Tom's turn again. Yes, definitely. And thank you, Michelle. Um, as you could see, uh, we really had some um, great sort of underpinning to what we found in those listening sessions that came from the survey. But the other thing that came from the survey, in addition to our quantitative information, we got a number of excellent quotes from survey participants, and you may see similar issues uh, going on. So I want to talk about a few key trends, and I'll tell you, I'm going to be pouring over the chat from this uh, session as well, because I see some good comments uh, coming in on some of these uh, areas of discussion, too. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that people said. Um, one of the things is the interest in an organization that differentiates and attends to managing people versus managing collections, and the idea of the importance of leadership delegation and people skills, um, and then that can help specialists do their work. Um, we saw that uh, there might not be a very likely chance of uh, more paraprofessional positions with room for advancement, but what about gradations within a position? That was something that um, one of the collections archivists said could be helpful. Um, a person talked about their former job, working in the private sector, clear paths for career advancement, um, and any additional responsibility that was requested along with an adequate pay raise to take on the additional work. This person found that system to be much more respectful than the way they've experienced compensation discussions in the museum field. So that give and take might not be there quite as much. And we had someone who said fairly bluntly, our organization seems to have insufficient staff to ensure career or advancement planning. So some concerns that add to what we've been talking about and what we've heard. In our next slide, uh, and this is something we have tried to do um, through our, uh, our our work on our resources, through a number of things that we have on our website, um, but the idea of visual models and representations of um, ways that uh, transitions and um, succession can happen uh, would be really good to document and to pass on to future employees. There were software barriers, and we talked a little bit about that in both uh, the discussions that we had at our listening sessions and in the uh, survey information that Michelle just covered. When a person leaves, documents created by them and stored in individual data storage spaces disappear within days of their departure. And this is particularly in larger organizations with um, some maybe heavy duty or even heavy handed um, IT rules. You know, could there be a longer period of time, a way to identify which documents are tied to an individual so that when they leave the documentation doesn't go away? This was something that came up so much, even in our presentations this year, we were starting to talk about the resources that are available out there, that we actually are bringing in a uh, resource on file naming um, that one of my colleagues, uh, Lee Grinstead, had created because people said we would love to see file naming that wasn't you know, the, the former employee's last name and some small descriptor. Um, we want to see some things that are consistent across the organization. Occasional or cyclical budgetary constraints need to be addressed in every succession plan. And this is the idea of um, thinking about if someone leaves, are there things that are covered by grants? Are there things that are covered in the uh, financial planning for an organization that needs to be uh, thought of in the continuity of collection stewardship, in the continuity of artistic direction at an arts organization? Um, and then we had a university archivist who said they presented on succession planning guidelines at uh, two regional conferences um, and stressed things like written policies, 
which we're talking about here, making sure collections and materials are documented and labeled, organization, and a number of other areas. And they said that basically the issue is too many archives have too few staff to create a succession structure. So we don't think that we will be able to help you create a complete succession structure, but we're thinking about what kind of tools can we give you to make it easier for your organization, easier for new people to join the organization. And then a few more notes on our last slide. Um, this is uh, an observation similar to our focus groups. Part of succession planning needs to include fair compensation for those who take on succession execution. Is that something that we can think of um, for the staff that remains and that is helping this new person come in and helping with the transition? Um, convince higher ups that some people who take, take care of collections need skill sets that just aren't found among anyone with a degree in anything. Um, otherwise, they won't see a, a need for succession planning. And this was interesting because at first I was like, well, this was a little off the cuff. But I think it really is interesting, particularly for people who have been at an organization for a long time, uh, particularly for people who have developed specialist skills. Um, we need to think about um, making sure that this is not just executive succession planning, but it's succession planning for all levels of uh, the work that is done at cultural heritage and artistic organizations. Um, and this next one, um, I heard this so many times in uh, our individual uh, discussions and interviews with people in our, uh, our listening sessions. We have written policies and procedures that provide for continuity of operations. But when the processing archivist retired, they couldn't locate the collections on the shelves because when she ran out of room, she put newly processed collections or additions to established collections wherever she could find shelf space. She knew that you know she knew where she put it, but none of the rest of them did, and she didn't keep a map or a shelf list. So there was a ton of trouble when she left, uh, spending a lot of time trying to locate collections or parts of collections that weren't shelved with the original accession. Um, this is something we heard time and again. And you know, if anything, if we can help you know, have this uh, speed bump, which could be more like a roller coaster, um, get taken care of. That's something that we would like to do. Um, and Michelle has talked about this during a lot of her comments. Um, in a small institution where everyone is already doing more than what their job title is, it's very hard to find the time and resources to do this kind of planning. What doesn't get done in order to do large-scale planning? This is what small institutions need help with. And this is where we're trying to create resources in this project that can help on this kind of thing. Because we know that you're not going to have somebody who can step out and say, oh, I'm going to give 100% of my time for this next month to succession planning. It needs to be something that's baked in, that's built in. So. As we go to our next slide, we've had an opportunity to ask a few poll questions today, and some, especially that first poll, those uh, uh, results were really interesting to me. Uh, but we also wanted to ask a few questions where you can provide some longer answers in the chat. So if you can tell us in the chat what you see as the biggest barriers for addressing succession planning at your organization, that will be great. And I will try to keep an eye on those comments as we are going through the discussion. But um, you know, if uh, we'll also take a look at what we see in chat um, uh, as we go along. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can read off those questions as they come in, or Great. those answers. Um, so um, from Emory, we have a biggest barrier is not enough time, especially not enough time for everyone to sit down together. I think that sounds really important qualification on the time question there. Um, yep, yeah, time and how to get started is another great response. Yeah, maybe as, as people are, are kind of chiming in with thoughts, um, I had sort of a similar time question as I was responding to your um, presentation, which is from the organizations that you have heard from that have done succession planning, is there like a 
if you have data on like the amount of time it takes to do this work from start to finish, or even informally, if you've had any, um, you know, chats with people and how long it takes. Um, I don't think, and Michelle, I'd really love to hear your um, input on this uh, as well. I don't think we had anybody who really talked about, um, you know, the uh, amount of time and uh, who, you know, did this as sort of all at one time type of activity. But what they said was thinking about building in documentation and building in policies um, as much as you can, um, can really help uh, to set a good, um, I, I guess, runway, a takeoff runway to be able to do this and make it a, an easier landing and not really a crash landing um, if we can think about um, doing that. So it's more a cumulative type of thing um, than it is uh, being able to, uh, you know, to, to, to set aside some time. Although Michelle and I have been thinking, is there a way people can take, you know, a, a couple of hours a month that maybe a team could take a couple hours a month uh, to think about this kind of thing? And I can see all sorts of things coming in on uh, chat. Greg, any uh, trends that you're seeing on that? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with documentation as we've been talking about I'm seeing a lot of sort of best practice questions and I'm seeing um salary coming through okay. great among many other things I mean these are great I hope we can um we'll definitely sh uh, save this chat um and and we can all pour over it and and this will be very helpful to us as we move forward with the succession planning um, and yeah, okay. and I think, oh, Michelle, go ahead, please. I was going to say, I'm, I'm taking a look. I, I'm intrigued by uh, Katie's comment that the taboo of discussing leaving and retirement yeah. as a possibility is that on the, the side of the employee who's potentially retiring or on the part of the, the board or, or management in posing that question to somebody. Um, you know, I, I could see on on both ends, but I I what I was going to say in response to Greg's question is that we didn't have a lot of data on how long it might take to to do some of these documentation processes. But what we where we did hear successful strategies, it was that um, somebody who knew they were going to retire within months, years, was very intentional about. Um, either documenting things before they went or identifying a successor or working with that person. Um, so, you know, that that leads me to believe it's a, a months long endeavor um, if, if you're going to put that intention into it. Excellent. Um, we, we have a, a question here that's coming through, um, which is, whoops, that just went away. Let me find it. I'd be interested if, organizations do any cross training as part of their succession plan and um, yeah we have seen and we have been talking about the idea of uh, this whole idea of the knowledge transfer process that we talk about um, being a way to do uh, cross training and even cross departmental training um, so that is something that has come up and um, there's I'll mention it here there's a really good resource that's out there at the NCAPER National Coalition on Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response website site and it's called Organizations at a Crossroads and it was actually created when we were seeing a number of arts organizations shutting down during COVID and um, they talked about the sort of financial archiving and um, then uh, knowledge transfer aspects of things that could be done if an organization went through major changes or had to shut down so that was a, a really um, uh, interesting direction to go. And I think even before I had a chance to uh, sort of get to question number two here, I've been seeing some good responses to that. But if you haven't had a chance to respond to our second question, the one small step or most impactful step to address succession planning at your institution, um, we would love to get more information in the chat about that as well.
and yes, I will make sure that we get some information out. I will uh, uh, put that in the chat. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know if I can put a link in right now, but uh, we, we can share I will that put in the full name. Okay. Up. Yeah, I think that'd be easier because otherwise it might get lost for people. Um, here's one small step that someone put out, which is fill out a, sam a simple document to at least get started. List accounts, passwords, managers, keys, equipment, et cetera. Mention important policies, job descriptions. Yes, those are great ideas. Uh, thank uh, I you. Think, oh, uh, we have some, I think this is the small step um, question maybe, uh, which is take the time to write down institutional knowledge that you know of so that there is a document for people that come behind you. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. Uh, we also have had uh, some ideas on, can we do some uh, oral history, uh, particularly maybe oral history videotaping of that kind of information. So I think that that is great. And this idea from Megan uh, Currents being an early career, I've had several time limited contract roles, but making sure to leave deliverables with the institution and documentation as to what work they weren't able to finish and what should be prioritized by the next person. If we could see that in all these cases, we would not have to do this project. This is wonderful. Thank you for that idea. I'm glad you put that in there. Um, and, and we do have a question, uh, just a, a logistics question. Will, will participants have access to the chat information? Yes, we can save that um, and, and make that available to you, which we'll follow up with in, in the email, the follow-up email that we send out, so. Okay. Well, this has been great with the information that we've gotten uh, as the answer to these two questions and to our polls. And I want to actually uh, hand things back to Michelle because she's got some ideas on some resources and some more opportunities for you to get additional information. Yes. Um, so this is the uh, QR code that will take you to the website where um, all of the the currently available resources are uh, accessible. And um, one of the, the first ones is this top 10 things you can do now. Um, again, this the idea behind this was something like if you've only got a couple minutes to do today or an hour to do this week, um, it, a lot of the things that folks just suggested in the chat are items that are on this list. Um, another theme is is uh the the level of of risk you know what's at stake if if this if you don't make time for succession planning um the succession risk advocacy matrix uh the the third one listed here is a tool that um can be helpful in in kind of quantifying um what is at stake if if the organization does not take time for succession planning um and then uh, Tom mentioned the file naming strategies uh, to aid in succession planning. Um, another option is the um, 30, 60, and 90 days after starting a new job. I noticed a lot of the comments dealt with folks who are like walking into a situation that's kind of a mess and how do you both kind of make sense of where things are and then move forward in a, in a constructive way that, that plans for the future. Um, that resource tries to address that. Um, and I know we're coming up on time, so hopefully folks can um, take a quick peek at these resources. But our next webinar um, on July 10th, we'll, we'll review those resources in much greater detail. We've kind of organized them um, with this idea of a roadmap. You know, what, what should you do before you have the need for succession? Um, how do you navigate one of those transitions? And then post-transition, what, what do you do to improve things for the next time that that, that inevitably happens? Um, we are looking uh, to, to bring together some practitioners who, who can provide case studies of, of succession planning, hopefully done, done well, because um, I think we all kind of kind of know the the sad stories 
um, or the horror stories when when things don't go well. So looking to to have some folks who've who've been in the trenches and can can give you some some good examples of how to move forward. And then um, our idea in the fall is to have an online course that will really kind of systematically work through some of these resources and tools um, and to do that in a, in a cohort so that folks can learn from each other and support each other. Uh, and then we also have additional presentations coming up at uh, conferences, and those are all listed on the website as well. And um, so here is our contact information. If anybody wants to follow up uh, directly with me and Tom, um, we have quite a few other colleagues at CCHA and Lyricists who have been supporting this project as well. Um, and we are just continuing to be excited about the opportunity to engage with folks because we know how important the topic is. Okay. And Thank Michelle, you. I was going to add one thing really quickly. Um, uh, the 30, 60, 90 uh, uh, sort of grid that Michelle made up has been, I think, the most popular thing that we've been uh, taking to these conferences. People really like um, that for developing and bringing on new uh, staff. And the other thing I was going to mention is the bibliography. That bibliography tends to grow every week or two weeks with more um, good insights. So that's one to come back to. When you go to the site the first time, take a look at all the resources and come back every once in a while to the bibliography. Thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tom. This was an amazing um, conversation. Thank you, everyone who's here today for, for showing up for this really important topic. Um, like I said, we've already said this, but we're going to share those resources. Please look for our next webinar on this topic on July 10th, as Michelle mentioned. Um, Tom will come back and we'll be joined by Diani Feige, our Director of Preservation Services, to talk more about um, those resources, as we mentioned. Um, and thank you to Camilla Dawson for all of the behind the scenes work to make this webinar possible, um, all the polls in the chat and everything. So, um, and uh, we hope you all have a great afternoon and we hope to see you at the next one. Um, and when this when this window closes, a little survey will pop up in your browser. So we just would love for you to uh, fill that out um, and let us know how we're doing. And we'll share the link to this video as well as the uh, resources and the meeting chat with you in a follow-up email.